Thank you, worship team. Daniel chapter 7 is where we find ourselves today, but before we begin, I just want to say something that I was reminded to say by an older pastor, a friend of mine, he said you need to say this frequently, I love you guys. You know, we, we've just gone through a vote that wasn't successful, and guess what? We didn't split. Praise the Lord. Amen? I mean, I, listen. God is so good, and if we all are attempting to follow him through his word, live out the precepts of scripture, God can keep us strong and together and unified, and I love it, and I love you guys, and I love being part of Delaware Bible Church. Amen. Now, I got a couple of questions for you. This is the interactive part of the service, so uh, uh, you can feel free to answer these out loud. Um, Would you like to know, yes or no, What's going to happen to you when you die? That's weak. Okay, that's weak. Would you like to know what's going to happen to you when you die? Yes or no? Okay, I think that's true. Universally speaking, I think that everybody wants to know, am I going to go to heaven, be with the Lord? Am I going to go to hell? I think that's we talked about, that we can have assurance of that. Uh, God's word points that out. Second question. Uh, Would you like to know how this world is going to end? Yes or no? Yeah, you would like to know. I think generally speaking, we'd like to know that, right? Now, I want to ask you a third question. This is a bit more challenging. How many in here would like to know, uh, yes or no, whether you would like to know the exact moment that you're going to die? Somebody said absolutely or absolutely not. You'd like to know the exact moment that you're going to die. See, that's that's trickier, right? That's trickier because uh, there have been... For example, there have been lots of Hollywood movies made, books written about this thought experiment of what if you could know the exact moment that you're going to die. And what ends up happening, right, at least in this thought experiment, understanding human nature and all these things, is that some people, knowing the moment they're going to die, is going to lead them to veer their lives off into licentious and sinful living, right? Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow I'm dead, you know? And for another group of people, it's going to, it's going to, steer them off into kind of a panicked rush to, uh, you know, settle accounts with their family and and make sure that their loved ones are cared for and all these kinds of things and and put them on kind of this frantic pace to get all that done and and say their goodbyes, right? It's not a peaceful situation no matter how you look at it. And I just want to point out to you that as we turn the corner here from Daniel chapter 1 to 7, which is kind of the historical book's part of Daniel, uh, chapters of Daniel, and we turn towards Daniel 7 to 12, which is very prophetic, right? Our loving God has kind of threaded that needle for us. What I mean by that is in these prophetic chapters, he's going to kind of give us a glimpse at what's going to happen and how this world is going to end. We're going to see that today, right? How this world is going to end. He's going to give us a glimpse of what's going to happen in the world with all these world powers that are dominating in the world today and, and in the future. But he's not going to tell us exact dates and times. And I think that we, we should agree, I think, that our God who loves us so much that he sent his son to die on the cross for our sins has done that intentionally and for our good. Jesus said no one knows the day or the hour that, you know, the end is coming except for the Father himself. And so keep these things in mind, that these things that are being revealed to us in these prophetic books of the Old Testament, prophetic book of Daniel, chapters of Daniel, that that this is being revealed to us by a God who loves you so much that he's giving you what you need to give you the hope and endurance to carry on, but not so much as to cause you to panic or lose lose sight of the, the mission. It's really good stuff. This chapter, for all of you that are younger in the room, okay, this chapter is crazier than a Marvel movie, right? This chapter of the Bible, look at all the things that are in this, in this chapter. Dreams, visions, mutant creatures, okay? More like, more crazy than a Marvel movie or, you know, sci-fi movie. Uh, a heavenly courtroom scene and an everlasting kingdom. That's just some of the contents of this one chapter of God's Word. So, let's get into it. Before we do, though, I want to give you some things to think about. First of all, chapter 7 is very parallel, very much parallel, 
Daniel, 7, Daniel chapter 2, where Nebuchadnezzar had this dream of this image that had uh, you know, a head of one metal and shoulders and a torso of another metal and then you know, waist and thighs and feet and legs of another. Uh, it's very, very parallel to that in that, in that, that uh, God is laying out for Daniel the things that are to come, the kingdoms that are to come. There's some differences, though, in this. Also, I want to give you some guidance as to how to read prophecy. And, and honestly, I'm just going to be straightforward with you. Uh, I, I don't always like flock to, to teach or preach on prophecy a whole lot. I, I, I'm happy to do it. it. It doesn't scare me in any way. But I'm, I'm just aware, aware of the fact that I grew up in a time where uh, studies on prophecy in the, in the church focused a lot on the minute details of what every symbolic thing meant. And I've come to the conclusion because I think I, like many believers, went through a prophecy stage when I was younger where I was just reading all the prophecies and trying to figure out what everything meant and what everything symbolized. All. I, I've come to the conclusion that that's a bit unfruitful. In other words, you can, you can uh, miss the forest for the trees, so to speak. And, and so I want to give you some things to think about as it relates to reading uh, and understanding prophecy. Number one is to kind of keep your focus on the big picture more than the fine detail. Fine details are fine to look at, whatever. But, you know, you always should be walking away from a, a prophetic passage and asking yourself the question, what is God trying to teach me here? What's God trying to show me here? Rather than to focus all of your mental energy on what does the sick, what does the events of the sixth seal in the book of Revelation symbolize, right? Just take a break on that, all right? Second thing is just to avoid speculation. Oftentimes, the things that are told to us in Scripture are then interpreted by Scripture, right? In other words, there's some things that are going on here in Daniel chapter 7 that we're not going to learn the interpretation to until chapter 8. There's some things going on in chapter 7 that are parallel with chapter 2. So oftentimes, the Bible itself will bring these things out, and that's what you should look for. But what we shouldn't be doing is reading things in the Scripture, right? Like, for example, today, the fourth beast. There's a lot... There's a lot of people that will make a, a declarative, like I'm confident proclamation that I know exactly what the fourth beast is, what the ten horns symbolize, what the little horn symbol, like, and I'm just going to tell you, they don't know, okay? They say they know, but they oftentimes don't know. And then the third thing is just be aware that in prophetic, in prophetic sections of the Bible, uh, the, the line, the exact particular line of where the, the, the prophet is talking about the past and when the prophet is talking about the future, that line is often blurry. And, and so you just need to know that. And, and that's a lot of times where, where disagreements come in. I mean, you realize that in the area of eschatology, you know, the study of the end times, there are people that believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, a mid-tribulation rapture, and a post-tribulation rapture. And then there's people that don't believe there's a rapture at all. Okay, why is that? It's because the line between what is past and what is future is often blurry, and that causes people to make different conclusions. Now, with all that being said, I need to say one last thing, and that's this. And this is very important for our time today in the world that we live in right now, which is this. Consider the reliability of the prophet. Consider the reliability of of the prophet. We have read Daniel chapter 1 to Daniel chapter 6, and what have we seen? We have seen this man, Daniel, who came to Babylon as a young man, and is now probably at this, you know, as, as the book progresses, he's getting to be an, an old man. But what we see is that Daniel was enabled by God to tell Nebuchadnezzar not only the interpretation of his dream, but, it, but the dream and the interpretation in Daniel chapter 2. And everything that Daniel said came to pass. Daniel was enabled by God to tell Nebuchadnezzar the interpretation of his second dream in Daniel chapter 4, and everything that Daniel said was going to happen came to pass. Nebuchadnezzar was turned into a beast, and then he was restored once he acknowledged God, right? <clears throat> Daniel was enabled by God to read and interpret the handwriting on the wall to Belshazzar in chapter 5, and everything that Daniel said was going to happen, happened. This is an important thing. Daniel is a reliable prophet. 
And, and all along the way, by the way, Daniel never, Daniel never walks around, seems to never walk around with this attitude of, you know, I'm the greatest prophet Israel has ever seen. Yep, me. I've got all the prophetic powers. You guys don't have the prophetic powers. I'm no, he's always, he's always saying, God has revealed this to me. God has given me this, this thing to say. God has revealed and opened my eyes to what's going on here. And so he's, he's always pointing the finger at God. And this is very important to us because I want you to contrast Daniel with, and, and I don't know if you even know this or not. I don't know if you're this much of a, of a Christianity nerd to understand that there are other churches, some even in this area, who have people in them that claim to be modern-day prophets. And I'm not talking about prof a prophet like a proclaimer of the truth of God's word, because that's one sense of the word. Because in that sense of the word, I'm a prophet. You know, the, all of our pastors, the guys that teach and preach are prophets. I'm talking about being able to foretell, being given a message by God to foretell what's coming, that kind of prophet. There are people today in the church today, not this church, but in some churches that claim to be modern-day prophets. The problem with this is that they make predictions that don't come true, and they make predictions that are often so vague that you can never, whether it happens or not, you can't really pin down what happened, what's happening. The Lord has told me that there's coming to this church a shaking, a shaking. We're going to be shaken. What does that mean, right? <clears throat> there's others that say things like, uh, God is going to bring and cause an awakening in you. Well, I'm going to wake up tomorrow, Lord willing. You know, I mean, what are you talking about? Uh, God is going to cause you, he's, going to, he's calling you to step into a new role. Well, what role? I mean, Daniel is saying, <laughs> Daniel is saying to Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to turn into a beast for a while, and then when you come to know who God is, then you're going to be transferred, and then it happens. It, these, these prophecies, quote unquote, that are being made by modern day prophets, don't hold a candle to what Daniel and the other Old, Prop, Testament, Old Testament prophets did. So just be mindful of that. When somebody steps on into your life and says that they're a modern day prophet, consider the reliability of the prophet. I'll end this introduction with this. De uh, Deuteronomy 18, 20 to 22 says, but the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how may we know that the word from the uh, that the word of the Lord? So how may we know that the word that the Lord has not spoken? And the answer is this: When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. So, with all these things being said, let's get into the text today. I'm going to work my way through here. First, let's talk about this. Number one, the world is a chaotic place. The world is a chaotic place. Look at verses one and two. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. Okay, so when we ended chapter six, Daniel was under King Darius and Cyrus, the Medes and the Persians. There was a new empire. So in this prophetic section, we're going back in time a little bit to when Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, was still on the throne. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Let's stop right there. And you may ask yourself, how do I get this world as a chaotic place from those two from those two verses. Well, um, in the first of all, let me point out this. In the past, like in Daniel chapter 2, the king was having a dream, and Daniel was interpreting the dream. Now Daniel is having the dream, and he's writing it down, and then later we're going to see God's going to give him the interpretation of his own dream. It's fascinating stuff. But secondly, there's a phrase in these first two verses that I just, to be honest with you, I just blew past it the first time I was studying this, and that is the phrase, um, that is the phrase, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. I want to take a look at that phrase in more detail because it's easy to overlook. The winds are coming from heaven, the four winds of heaven, and the great sea is on the earth. 
there seems to be other Bible passages that talk about this concept of the winds of heaven, right? The, the four winds of heaven or the winds of heaven or four winds. And, and so let me just point a few of them out to you. This is in the context, this is Ezekiel 37, 9. This is in the context of the valley of the dry bones where God supernaturally caused these bones to come together and to reform and to come alive. It says this, Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. Another passage to keep in mind, Zechariah chapter 2, verse 6, another prophet, Up, up, flee from the land of the north, declares the Lord, for I have spread you abroad as the four winds of heaven, declares the Lord. And the context here is Zechariah is encouraging the people, the 70 years are up, it's time to go back to Israel, back to Jerusalem and rebuild. Um, but, he, but what he's saying here is that these four winds, the four winds of heaven, uh, they, they scattered the people abroad. In other words, God did something here. He scattered the people as he said he would. He put them into uh, exile as he said he would. And then <clears throat> just Revelation 7, 1, one more. It says, after this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth. Here's the four winds of the earth. That no wind might blow on the earth or the sea or against any tree. And here the context is, during the midst of the, the end times, right, as things are getting really bad, there's a little bit of a pause. There's a holding back and a pause in these terrible events that are happening. Uh, and, and this pause is God ordained. And so you can see the angels holding these things back. What seems to be in view here is that these four, the four winds of heaven stirring up the great sea, the great sea, some people speculate as the Mediterranean Sea, whatever, that's speculation. But the, the idea here is that God is at work doing something. The four winds of heaven, God is at work doing something, and, and that's causing a tumultuousness. That's causing a churning up of the, of the great sea, which is on the earth. Some people speculate, uh, so, some, some people, well, we can say for, with some confidence that the sea in chapter 7, verse 2, is the earth, because it's going to say that these beasts are going to come out of the sea, and then in 7, 17, it's going to say they're kings that come from the earth. So there's a connection there in the text. And, and some people say that the, um, the, that the sea is actually representative of the nations. And that happens a lot in Scripture as well. For example, in Revelation 17, 15, it says, And the, the angel said to me, The waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are the peoples and the multitudes and the nations and the languages. So again, don't want to speculate here. It's just that this four winds of, this, of, the, of heaven stirring up the sea, it, it, it's starting to, to look like that this is the, that God is working, right? He's the four winds of heaven, or he's sending the four winds of heaven. God is at work, and that's causing tumultuousness amongst the, the earth or the nations or whatever on the, in the world. There's places that indicate this. Jesus talked about this, for example, in Matthew 26, 24, 6. He says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. Um, Ephesians 6, 12 put this in the context of a spiritual battle. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Before I leave this point, I'm, I'm belaboring it on purpose, but before I leave this point, let me just give you some examples that we've already seen in the text of Daniel. The fiery furnace. What happened with the fiery furnace? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were told to bow down to a false god. They would not do it. That caused what? Conflict. The, the, the king was enraged. He was upset with them. He, he, he hastily fired up the furnace to hotter than it's supposed to be, and he, he had the guys cast in and cost him some of his own men, and they died. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego lived, preserved by God. It also happened in the lion's den, right? What happened there? Uh, a, a rule was made that a certain, you had to, you know, you pray only to the king, right? And Daniel said, no, I'm going to continue to pray to my God. He was caught by some nefarious characters. He was turned into the king, and the king had was forced to carry out his rules, so he had to throw Daniel into the lion's den according to the law that he had made, and Daniel is protected by God from lions. 
This happens in our everyday lives, folks. You're, you're at work. You're just doing your job, the job that you're, you were hired to do, paid to do. And somebody comes along and says, we are now saying you must get on board with this agenda. And you say, I can't. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I can't go down that road. And what is there? There's conflict, right? We see this in, you know, in just living out a Christian life in general of, of wanting to, to speak the truth and to, and to live according to God's word and to pray to God and all these kinds of things. It causes conflict on the earth. So we're in a cosmic battle every day, right? Our adversary, Satan, wants to chip away at your faith bit by bit by bit. And he wants to chew away at your faith and your obedience to God. These chapters, I believe, are, help, are designed to help us to resolve, to, to have courage to carry on. Now, this is just a weird, this is like a weird, dumb thing about how my brain works. But like, as I was preparing this message and I was meditating on this phrase, right? The, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. What came to mind is an album that I listened to when I first came to Christ. And I was listening to Christian music, which is, a Rich Mullins album, and the title of it is Winds of Heaven, Stuff of Earth. And I was just thinking, I wonder if Rich Mullins had this scripture in mind, this passage of scripture in mind when he wrote this, talking about, and Rich Mullins was always a guy that was really honest about his, his internal conflict of wanting to follow God and wanting to be like Jesus Christ, but also honest about his struggles in the real world of the, 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 the lusts of the flesh and all the different things that, the temptations that we face day to day. And I wonder if he was like living in that tension when he came up with this album title. Okay, so let's move on. Out of this chaos, beasts emerge. Look at verses 3 to 8. So he's, he's having this vision. Verse 3, and four great beasts came out of the sea different from the other, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings then I looked, and its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man, and it had the mind of a man. The mind of a man was given to it, and behold, another beast, a second one, like a bear. It was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and it was told, arise, devour much flesh. And after this, I looked, and behold, another, like a leopard. Some translations say a panther. A leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came upon them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and mouth and a mouth speaking great things. Let's just stop right there. Okay, let's all just take a breath and say, this is weird. Okay, this is crazy stuff. There is no such thing as a lion that has wings or a panther or a leopard that has four sets of wings or four wings. On. This is all strange stuff. Remember, this is a vision that Daniel is having. Okay. Now, again, just the way my strange Generation X brain works and the fact that I watched too much TV growing up as a kid, when I read about these beasts coming out of the sea, this is the first thing that comes into my mind. Maybe you're like me. I don't know. It's... It's Godzilla, right? Coming out of the water to attack everybody. Right? <laughs> Maybe I'm just crazy. It's Godzilla coming out of the... No, okay, never mind. Now, I want us to remember this whole concept of beast is in Daniel. It's back in chapter 4. It's Nebuchadnezzar. What happened, do you remember what happened that caused Nebuchadnezzar to be turned into a beast? Does anybody remember? Pride. It was his pride, right? 
He had been around Daniel long enough to know and even acknowledge with his lips that the, the God of Daniel was the one true God. After the fiery furnace, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He acknowledged that the God of, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was the one true God. And yet one day, after he had received this prophecy that God was going to turn him into, he had had this dream and it was interpreted by Daniel that he was going to be, <coughs> excuse me, turned into a beast. He's up on his balcony. Look at this Babylon that I've created with my own hands. I mean, I'm such an awesome king. There's nobody like me. Everything is awesome because I made it awesome. And boom, God does what God said God was going to do. He turns him into a beast. And he remains a beast for how long? Until when? Until he acknowledged that the God of Daniel was the one true God. At that point, he came in from out in the field. His, his, his countenance like a man was returned to him, right? He was restored to his place of authority in the kingdom, and his, his uh, advisors came and sought wisdom from him again. So what does that tell you? That should tell you, <coughs> excuse me, that should tell you that I'm getting choked up. That should tell you that these beasts are representative, or, and we're going to learn this later, these beasts are representative of rulers that are going to come on the earth that are not going to rule in any sh way, shape, or form that is consistent with acknowledging that the God of Daniel is the one true God. They're going to forsake everything. They're going to do everything in a very worldly, ungodly way. We're going to see that. <coughs> Excuse me. We must, we, folks, we got to remember to read the Bible in context. And, and it's important that we understand what, this, what these beasts are talking about. Now, these beasts are going to come and they're going to rule through fear and force. We're going to see that here in a minute. Um, and, and we all need to just stop for a moment and, and consider something before we go too much further. We, we all need to take a humility pill this morning. And here's what I'm asking you to consider. How many of us, and you can, you can, in any way you want to acknowledge this, you can. How many of you are getting somewhat sick and tired of the way that we are being governed right now? Is anybody getting sick and tired of the corruption, of the lies, of the deceit, of our tax dollars being taken and being spent on who knows what to enrich who knows who? Is anybody getting tired of that? It's kind of beastly what's happening right now, isn't it? But what do we want? What if, a, what if a candidate or a politician or a leader rose up who said, I'm going to come and I'm going to show grace and mercy to that person. And, and if you vote me in, I'm going to rule as self-sacrificially as I possibly can uh, all the people of the United States. I'm just saying, I'm just, this is a scenario, right? Would we want that person? Or do we want another beast Who's chanting? I'm going to lock that beast up. I'm going to take that. I'm going to put that that beast and all their compatriots. They're going to jail. You vote me in, and that's what I'm going to do. In our fallen sinfulness, folks, oftentimes we want the beast. We want the beast to come in and clean up what the previous beast did. So just know that. Just understand that. Like we're, we're not. We, this is just part of like the way the world works, and we're part. We, you know, we're living in the tension here of the already and not yet. We're part of the kingdom of God, but we're not, it's not fully realized on the earth yet. We're his representatives. Now, incidentally, for all of you guys that like to read like uh, crazy stuff into the scripture, here's something that, I, that you could read crazy into the scripture. Do you know that the limousine that's bulletproof that the president rides around in, do you know what it's called? It's called the beast. <laughs> That was a joke, okay? It is called the beast, but, but let's not read that into Scripture, okay? That's what other people do. We're not doing that here at Delaware Bible Church. Okay, so it's going to rule through fear and force. These, but, but these beasts do not endure, right? One of them comes along, and then he's replaced by another, and then another, and then the fourth, fourth beast comes along. These beasts are terrifying in different ways, okay? And so let's, let's, let's take a look at that. There's, there's this artwork that's been done to kind of try to depict these beasts, 
there's a website of, of a guy that does this stuff. And so the first piece, what, what does it say? It says, um, chapter, uh, verse 4, the first was like a lion that had eagle's wings, okay? And as I looked, the wings were plucked off. So it used to, wings typically denote speed. So the, it was going fast, but the wings were plucked off. So then it went slower, right? And then it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. And, was, and the mind of a man was given to it. Lots of scholars believe, and chapter 8 will bear this out, I believe, as does chapter 2, that this first beast is the Babylonian Empire. And this reference to being stood on a feet and act like a man was when Nebuchadnezzar, after becoming a beast himself, was restored and acknowledged the God of Daniel as the one true God. So a lot of people think this first beast represents the Babylonian Empire. There's a lot of internal evidence to suggest that. Then you've got this. Behold, a second beast, verse 5, Another beast, a second one, like a bear, was raised up on one side, and it was raised up on one side, and had three ribs in its mouth and between its teeth, and it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. Now again, chapter 8 and back to chapter 2 is going to bear out. A lot of scholars believe this is the Medio Persian Empire, represented by a bear, and it's raised up on one side, meaning that between the Medes and the Persians, one was more powerful than the other. It was raised up on one side, but they were they came together to form an empire. And then, um, and, and they were particularly cruel in their ways, and so that's why you got to devour much flesh and all this kind of stuff. And then there's this third one that's got like a four-headed leopard or a four-headed panther. After this, I looked, and behold, another like a leopard with four wings, very fast, and, uh, of the four wings of a bird on its back, and the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. Again, chapter 8, back to chapter 2, is going to tell us that this is probably the Greek Empire, uh, that it was lightning fast under Alexander the Great, and then after Alexander the Great died suddenly, his, his dominion was divided up into four heads, four kings. And But again, you know, these things are going to be verified in Scripture through chapter 2 and through chapter 8. But then you've got this fourth beast who's not like any other beast. You know, the other ones kind of looked like an animal, a lion, like a lion with wings, like a like a bear, but it's raised up on one side, like a, like a panther or a leopard, but it's got four wings. This one doesn't look like any other beast. He's indescribable almost, but he's very smooth with words. So some people have drawn that beast like this, kind of looks like a dinosaur to me, but, but that this beast has all these horns on it and everything like this. <clears throat> After this, I saw... Verse 7, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth that devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet different from the other beasts that were before, and it had ten horns. And it talks about how one of those horns plucked up three of the horns, a smaller horn that had eyes and, and all this kind of stuff. It, it just gets, it gets wild. Later on in Daniel's text that we're going to learn more about what this fourth beast is all about. But some people speculate, and this is strict speculation, that this fourth beast is the Roman Empire. And that this beast is going to, re this, you know, the Roman Empire is no more on the earth. But that someday the Roman Empire is going to be revived. There's going to be a neo-Roman Empire. And it's going to be awful. That's all speculation what we can say for cert certain is that is that somewhere in there we think that <clears throat> uh, somewhere in there we've gone from past to future events, right? Somewhere in there we don't know where it's it's blurry. We've gone from past to future events, and that's going to be borne out by what we're going to read next. So these are just these are terrible rulers that are going to rise up, and they're not going to rule in the fear of the Lord. They are going to rule. Uh, they're going to rule in a very secular way, using fear and punishment and all these things to intimidate. The fourth beast is probably going to use not just those things, but persuasion. He's smooth with words. He's going to delude a bunch of people into believing that which is not true or fool them. All right, so let's, just, let's go into the last section here. The horror and the hope of what is to come. I've got to work through this quickly. Look at verse 9. He's still in the vision. <clears throat> The, the, the vision is going to change drastically now. He's been seeing these four beasts coming out of the sea. Now look. Verse 9. As I looked, thrones were placed, 
and the Ancient of Days took his seat. The Ancient of Days is God the Father, right? The Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was, a, was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. So apparently these thrones had some sort of some sort of aspect to them that they were also like chariot, like they looked like chariots. They had wheels of fire, right? A steam of fire, a stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him. That's a huge number of people. And 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court sat in judgment and the books were opened. Now, before I keep reading, let me just make this comment. Uh, If I get in trouble with the law and I go to court, and they sentence me to something, whether it's pay a fine or go to jail, the reason that they can do that is because they have authority over me, right? They have some authority over me to put me in jail. Otherwise, why would I go to jail? But they have authority over me under, you know, threat of my personal health, personal well-being. Here we see a courtroom view, and this court is convening, and it's going to pronounce judgment. This court has authority. Just keep that in mind. Verse 11, I looked because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. Okay, so now his his gaze is now taken off the courtroom scene and back to the fourth beast who's speaking all these smooth words. I looked because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking, and as I looked, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Many scholars believe that verse 12 is referring to the fact that when the Babylonian Empire finally ended, and it ended abruptly, that the Babylonian music, culture, philosophy, influence carried on for a time. That when the when the Greek or the Medio Persian Empire ended, that its 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 arts, its philosophy carried on for a time. And brothers and sisters, I can tell you with confidence, when the Greek Empire ended. We still, are, we still, in the United States of America in 2024, adopt much of the Greek philosophy governing. A lot of that was gr- generated uh, in Greek thinking. We're still experiencing that today. So that's what scholars believe verse 12 is talking about. Verse 13, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days. The son of man is, is likely Jesus Christ himself. So we're probably looking now into future times. He came into the ancient of days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious. The visions of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him if he asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Here we go. These four great beasts are four kings who shall rise out of the earth. Like the beasts came out of the sea are four kings that rise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever forever and ever. Those are some of the most encouraging words. Forever, forever, and ever. Then I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was, ex- which was different from the rest and exceedingly terrifying with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze, which devoured a broken pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. And the, about the ten horns that were on its head and the other horn that came up and before which three of them fell, the horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things that seemed greater than its companions. And I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them until the ancient of days came and judgment was given for the saints of the most high. And the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, as for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom which shall be different from all the kingdoms and it shall devour the whole earth and trample it down, and break it break it to pieces. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings shall arise, 
and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the former ones and shall put down three kings. He shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change the times and the law. And they shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. But the court shall sit in judgment and his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole of heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey Him. The reason that we know this is future is because that hasn't happened yet, right? Verse 28, this is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me. Who wouldn't be greatly alarmed by these dreams? And my color changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. Quickly, let me just share with you these things. First of all, we see in here a scene of a majestic court. And if you want to read more on what this might look like, read Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5. Because that same scene, I believe, is depicted in Revelation 4 and Revelation 5. We see in this, the fourth beast is destroyed. This court, however, whatever it means and whatever's going on there has dominion, has power, has authority, and the beast is destroyed. We also see that the Ancient of Days, probably referring to God the Father and the Son of Man, likely referring to Jesus referred to himself this way, uh, as the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, show up and they're in the courtroom together along with uh, many others. And they, this reminds me of, of when Jesus talked in Mark 14, 61, 62, when he said he was under trial, right? It says, as he was being questioned, it says, but he remained silent and made no answer. Again, the priest asked him, are you Christ? Are you the Christ, the son of the most blessed? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power coming with the cloud of with the clouds of heaven. And then finally, we see saints reigning in an everlasting kingdom forever, forever, and forever. Now, I know I went through that last section quickly, but I think it, I think it speaks for itself in that Daniel gives the rest of the dream and the interpretation is given to him. And you can see what is happening here. These beasts do not they do not make it. They're, they're all put down. And what is left is the Son of Man reigning with the saints forever and ever in an everlasting kingdom. So, let's talk about application. What in the world are we as Christians to take away from a, a chapter like Daniel 7? And on the one hand, it's awful. And on the other hand, it's the most wonderful thing ever. And here's the awful part. This is letting us know in language that we can understand. It doesn't give us the exact dates. It doesn't give us the exact configuration of what's going to happen. But it gives us enough information that we can know with confidence when it does come to pass that the things that are coming at us, the things that are coming at the human race in the next coming time is going to be horrible. This is going to be Whatever despotic kingdoms, whatever ruthless, tyrannical regimes have existed on the earth before, this fourth kingdom is going to put them all to shame. It's going to be awful. It, it pains me to think what, is going to, what we are going to be asked to endure. But this is a call for us to be firm in our faith, to understand, to know the word of God, and to practice it with as much gusto as we can. Read Revelation 14, 12, and 13. It's a call for us to be fervent and to endure to the end. There's going to be all kinds of temptation. Revelation talks about they're going to come and they're going to offer you the mark of the beast, right? You're going to be able to, to do commerce, buy and sell if you take the mark of the beast. And, and the Bible says, don't do it. God says, don't do it. Whatever that is, we don't know what exactly that's going to look like. Is it going to be a chip implanted in your head or something? We don't know. But what we are told to do 
is to continue to faithfully, obediently follow Christ to the best of our ability. Now, that's the bad part. It's going to be horrible. But here's the good part. The beast will be defeated and Christ will reign. And this gives us a tremendous amount of a tremendous amount of hope, right? The beast will be defeated. And not only are, is Christ going to reign, we are going to reign. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you are in Christ, you are going to reign with him. It's going to be incredible. It's going to be awesome. And it gives us a, a tremendous amount of hope to think that this is the way things are going to end up. But again, let's take another humility pill before we leave out of here. Why is it why is it that you and I get the privilege of reigning with Christ in an eternity, in a, in, a, in a kingdom that lasts forever, forever, and ever? Is it because I'm such an awesome guy and I'm so good at obeying God's word? It's not. Is it because you guys are so awesome and you guys are so diligent at obeying God's word? It's not. The only reason that you and I get any chance at this future, this future that's promised to us in God's word, is because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen? That's it. That's, that's our hope. That's all we got. And so think about that as you are uh, conducting your life. Think about that as you're making your decisions about where you're going to put your priorities and where you're going to invest your treasure and your time. We are here on a mission. It's a mission of love, to love God, everything that we've got, to love others and to make followers of Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. Is that the work that you're about? That kind of work is hard. That kind of work is also a faith-strengthening work. It will prepare you to endure. Oh, beloved, one last thing before we go, and that's just this. I had some weird, wacky experiences over the last week. Uh, coming into contact with, with other people and whatever. And, and let me just say this. It's becoming more and more clear that we are weird at Delaware Bible Church. We're weird. Because I want you, and I hope that you want to, know the Bible, to become biblically literate, to understand what God has said in His Word. And I'm, I'm, it's becoming more and more aware to me that, that there are other folks out there that are trying to follow Jesus that aren't all that interested in knowing what God has to say in his word. So I'll, I'll just leave you with this. If you are not making purposeful time throughout your weeks and your days and your years to spend time reading, studying, and meditating upon God's word, you're making a huge tactical error in what's coming at us. Learn the Bible. Know the Bible. Practice God's word. I beg you. Father, you have revealed yourself to us. Sometimes that revelation is very clear and straightforward, and sometimes it's crazy, like Daniel chapter 7. And yet, in that craziness, you've made it clear that there are king, there's a kingdom coming, an earthly kingdom, that's going to be horrifying. But you've also made it abundantly clear what is to come after the defeat of the beast, and the installation, the coming of your son Jesus in his second advent to establish his kingdom forever. Father, thank you for revealing these things to us. It helps us to prepare. And it helps us to hope. And those are two things that we desperately need at this particular moment in time. So Father, as we get into your word in our personal study, bless us with a deeper understanding of who you are through your word, empowered by your Holy Spirit to do so. And as we come across the world and the temptations to go away from what your word has to say into other places, Father, convict us and help us to walk diligently according to what you've so lovingly laid out for us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.